Hello, everyone. I'm Justin Anderson, Dartmouth's Vice President for Communications. I join you today from my office in downtown Hanover on Dartmouth's campus, where winter is still with us, but it does seem to be on its last legs, and spring break is right around the corner. I'm joined today, as always, by Dave Coates, Dartmouth Provost, and Rick Mills, Dartmouth's Executive Vice President. As I hope you know by this point, Dave and Rick lead Dartmouth's response to COVID, and as such, they are the stars of this webcast. So let's get to them and let's just dive right in. Looking at uh, Dartmouth's COVID dashboard, staying in close touch with the Dartmouth Hitchcock as we do and reading the Valley News, it certainly seems like all the trend lines that we study so carefully to gauge the state of the pandemic in the Upper Valley are moving in the right direction. Cases are down, positivity rates are down, booster compliance, at least on campus, is way up. At the state and national level, cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, thankfully, are going down. And expert guidance is changing as well. As a result, not surprisingly, we at Dartmouth will be making some changes also. So Dave, I'm gonna start with you and I'm gonna start with masks. Uh, what can we expect in terms of changes in Dartmouth's masking policy. Yeah, thanks, Justin. I'm really pleased like you to see all of those indicators going in the right direction. It's really uh, quite heartening. I, I'm pleased to say that Dartmouth will be shifting to a mask optional policy uh, starting on the 16th of March. That is the day after the end of winter term. So please remember to, for everyone who is here this on campus to keep wearing those masks indoors per the current policy through the end of winter term exams. But on March 16th, um, people are welcome to wear masks where they feel uh, it's helpful or comfortable, but are, they're no longer required in most indoor settings. There are a few exceptions that will be detailed in our email announcement and on our web pages, notably in healthcare settings and in uh, hop performances, given uh, some contractual arrangements with performers, things like that. But otherwise, Masks will be optional starting on March 16th. And Dave, it's fair to say that it's not just masks optional, it's masks welcome, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, and, um, I, I like that phrasing because we are all respectful of anyone who chooses to wear a mask or who needs to wear a mask going forward. And I would like to think that the rest of us will recognize that and uh, be respectful and, and welcoming to people who choose to, to take that path. I know this change in masking will be um, welcomed by many people who are uh, tired of wearing masks. But on the other hand, some people may still be anxious. Some people are still at risk. And I'm, I am uh, hopeful that the whole community be respectful of each person's decision to mask or not as they choose to do so. I think what we've heard from our peers is that as we, these kinds of transitions are hard and we ask everyone to be as accommodating and flexible and let's get through. This is another big transition for us and we, we need to get through it respectfully, as Dave says, and remind everyone, if you feel more comfortable wearing a mask or you need to go for it and it's great, it should be welcomed. And I'll point out that Dartmouth they will continue to supply KN95 masks as we do today. They'll still be freely and readily available. Rick, I'd like to go to you with a question on testing. You mentioned in, uh, in, in your remark a minute ago about transitions. How will we be transitioning on, on testing? Um, what, will be, what will we be requiring upon arrival for the spring? And then uh, how, will, how will the testing be administered over the course of the spring? How is it gonna look different from how it's been? Sure, so for the students that are returning to campus, they'll be, and who have not tested positive for COVID within the last 90 days, because if you have, then you're exempt from testing requirements, but we're not gonna do pre-arrival testing. What instead we're doing is a required PCR test within 24 hours of your return to campus. And when you take that test, You'll also be given two rapid antigen tests that you can take back to your residence. And you'll be asked to do a rapid antigen test relatively close to when you did your PCR test and before you attend class. And 
If you turn out to be positive, you need to contact Dick's House. There'll be information on the website about reporting your positive. If you're negative, you don't need to report anything. Keep going. And you should have the extra rapid antigen test for use when you need to. And a quick follow up for you on a, on a related on a related topic, which is uh, uh, isolation. Should you test positive? Um, how is that going to work? Is Are we going to continue the practice of isolating um, in your residence hall or your home? Will there be isolation space? How, 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 do you, how do you imagine that unfolding over the course of the spring? It's going to look just like it did in the winter. You'll isolate in place for five days, at which point you can go try to test out with a rapid antigen test. Um, but you will be isolating in place in your residence, just as we did during winter term. Well, I would just add to that, that uh, the masking policy, this is another one of those details that we do ask people who are, who have been in isolation, even if you test that on day five or day seven, to keep wearing a mask up to day 10. Um, or if you have symptoms, of course, you should be wearing a mask as well. But back to you, Rick. And just in one last element on the testing, which is our intention is that we will continue to do the routine testing that we did during winter term through April 10th. But assuming that we don't see anything unusual and we get through this return to campus as we hope to, we would expect that we would then end required testing and optional testing, PCR or symptomatic uh, antigen testing at the Axiom trailer or take-home antigen tests would be available, but we would no longer be requiring regular testing there may be exceptions to that that come up from athletic requirements or other sorts of things, uh, but we would not continue to go through the testing rubric that we've been in for so long. And when you say re regular testing and that testing rubric, you're referring to the the PCR tests that we that we that we either do ourselves or that we go to West Gym uh, 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 to have done. That's right. They'll still be available if you want to do them, um, but for, but they will no longer be required. And they'll still be available if you're traveling and you need a negative right. test for some reason for a place you're going, that, that will be open to you. Right. So two weeks or three weeks from March 21st to April 10th, uh, we'll be doing required surveillance testing just like we have been all winter and all fall. And then if unless something surprises us, then as of April 10th, so it'll go opt-in testing. Well, personally, I'm I'm grateful that the, the testing will still be available. I do like going for my own peace of mind every once in a while uh, to make sure that that uh, that I am negative. Uh, so I'm I'm pleased that that's continuing. Secretly, um, it makes people feel they've achieved something. It certainly does with me. Agreed. One, it's one of the only times you pass a test when you get a negative result. So true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Uh, negative is good. It's like an X-ray. Um, uh, uh, Dave, as the as the campus uh, becomes increasingly uh, uh, more open, as as the, we loosen these restrictions that that you you guys have both described, um, that means we're going to have more visitors. Um, which is great. Um, uh, what can what can our visitors expect uh, when they come onto campus or when they want to come onto campus? How is the visitor policy changing? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we have had a policy that required visitors who wanted to come to campus for some event or for a program or to visit the library to be vaccinated or to have a recent negative test. And as of um, March 16th, that policy will be relaxed. You, we still recommend, of course, that everyone be vaccinated and boosted, uh, but we will no longer require that. And so visitors can come to um, uh, you know, athletics events or visit the library or admissions uh, related programming. By the way, I'm sure we'll start to see a lot of the class of 26 coming through in April. Uh, you'll see them around campus and visiting visiting the dining hall and and, and uh, libraries and such. Um, the one possible exception is the Hopkins Center. Again, due to contractual relations with the performers that come from elsewhere, they may still require uh, visitors uh, to meet a higher standard for another month or two. So, Rick, we've so far talked about a lot of things that will be changing. I'd like to ask you a question about something I suspect will not be changing so much, and that is remote work. 
Uh, I know people are going to have a lot of questions as all of these changes are rolled out. What does that mean for uh, how and where and when I work? Uh, are you able to address that at this point? Sure. And, and certainly I understand as we make changes in policy, it, it brings this question up every time. Interestingly, the answer is the same that it's been for the past, I don't know, nine months, which is we really aren't, we no longer have a return to work date. We don't have a return to work definite proclamation. Instead, what we have is a much more openness to flexible arrangements where they work for a supervisor for job duties. And that may not be true for everybody. It, it may vary from place to place, but the real answer is to check in with your supervisor and work out an arrangement with your supervisor that meets the needs of Dartmouth. And at the end of the day, we'll be as accommodating as we can be. There isn't a definite requirement, but some jobs do require you to be on campus. You, you can't serve food in a dining hall if you're not on campus. You can't support a lab if you're a lab tech, if you're not on campus. And many of those folks have been on campus throughout all of this. There's no new policy. It's simply check in with your supervisor. Dave, uh, one thing that I think we've learned during the pandemic is that it doesn't progress uh, in a linear fashion. It, it doesn't, it, it moves around a lot. It changes direction. You take one step forward, two steps back. Sometimes you take three steps forward, one step back. And I know we're all quite optimistic about, uh, about the spring, but at the risk of being Debbie Downer, um, how are you thinking about different scenarios uh, uh, during the spring, should we have to take a step back, uh, you know, if there is a new variant or, or if, if for some reason the circumstances um, in and around Hanover change and cause us to reevaluate? How are you thinking about that as we, as we head into what we hope is going to be, is going to be an exciting uh, and more open spring? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely thinking about that, Justin. <clears throat> Every day I look at the graphs on the New York Times website showing the progress of various metrics, case counts, uh, hospitalizations, deaths, uh, and other metrics. And I noticed that we are now today at the same point we were at at the beginning of August last year um, in terms of the state of New Hampshire and, and, and steeply heading down in all the metrics that you want to go down. And that's great news to me. Uh, but on the other hand, what that reminds me of is that we hit Delta on campus right after that and then Omicron right after that. And so of course, there's always the possibility that another variant will pop up and make its way to Hanover. And so we will be watching all of these metrics very closely, watching trends elsewhere to see as kind of early warning indicators of what might be coming to Hanover. And if we have to resume uh, a higher level of testing or go back to masking, we will. Um, I certainly hope we never have to, but uh, we can't say never in this um, nonlinear uh, surprise ridden pandemic situation where we live. It seems highly unlikely we won't see another variant at some point. Maybe it's next fall, next winter, but as Dave says, we need to be monitoring, we need to be ready to adjust and respond. And I think we will continue to keep an eye on vaccination and booster recommendations. And you can expect that that will be an important part of how we manage this. And actually, uh, let me take that opportunity, Rick, to mention that there is a booster clinic on campus on Monday, the 14th of March, and I think another one coming up right at the end of the month, uh, very soon after most of the students have returned. And to encourage anyone who hasn't yet had the opportunity to get their booster to, to please go get their booster. It's probably the most important thing that will help them succeed and the campus succeed this spring. Dave, uh, we've talked a while now uh, about our priority being to protect the physical and mental health of our community while maintaining the in-person learning experience. Um, as, as we begin to open up um, and do more of the things that, that we were so used to doing pre-pandemic, um, how should we be thinking about your priorities? Is that still the North Star? Is that still how you and the, and the president uh, and Rick are, are, are thinking about operations or, or are we transitioning to something else? It, you know, it's, it's a great question, Justin. I would say that philosophy has not changed. 
What changes uh, on a constant basis as, we, as the pandemic evolves is how we balance the operations with respect to that philosophy. And so we are still keenly aware of the important need to protect people who are particularly vulnerable to this pandemic, uh, the very young, uh, people with uh, immunocompromised uh, conditions, uh, the very old, et cetera. And that's one reason why it's so important for all of us to be respectful of those people who choose to wear masks, for example, very important for us to uh, require a highly vaccinated campus as a means of protecting everyone on this campus and our community to provide high quality masks to people who, who need them, et cetera. And so that's what's, um, that philosophy has not changed but it's just the, the, the balance of protective measures that we're deploying in light of that philosophy. Rick, anything uh, to add on, on your end from that? No, I, you know, I think what Dave touches on is the need for all of us to go through this transition respectful of everyone having a different both condition at home that they're dealing with that you may not know about and we all have different risk tolerances and different senses of what makes us feel comfortable and safe versus exposed and vulnerable. And let's be as flexible and accommodating as we go through this transition as we can. Uh, Dave, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to go out here on a on a high happy note. Um, just like uh, once we hit Thanksgiving on the calendar, we start being uh, overwhelmed with. Christmas promotions and talk about Christmas. Well, well, on campuses like ours, once we begin the spring term, we start talking about commencement and getting ready for commencement and there's months of lead up. And so spring term will start in a couple of weeks and I'm sure we'll all turn attention to commencement. So what can you tell us at this, at this moment about commencement this year? Yeah, that's 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 a great point, Justin. Um, commencement um, will be on the green, uh, like it has been in the past. Uh, although amazingly, it's hard to believe, but it, the last time that happened was 2019, three years ago. And as far as we can tell today, it'll be run like commencement has in the past. Um, open seating, um, as many family members who want to attend can come and attend. Uh, and of course, Justin, I think our weather department is planning a beautiful sunny day, not too hot, not too windy. Um, we're still working on that. It's in the budget with the crystal ball, Dave. Oh, oh gosh. Okay. Well, we'll see that. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I, I'm sure in, in, in future videos that we do together, uh, we will we'll be able to talk about who the commencement speaker will be. So that's a little tease for, for future videos. Definitely, definitely keep watching because uh, that will be some exciting news uh, when, we, when, we, when we are able to share it uh, uh, in the spring. Great. Uh, so I wanna give both of you, uh, uh, Dave and Rick, an opportunity uh, to, for any last words or any last thoughts before we sign off for the day. Yeah, I guess I would just want to thank everyone who was here this winter term for their incredible patience and willingness to, um, to chip in to help us all get through this term. It's been a challenging term. I know for many people, including many who have been here for decades, so this is one of the most difficult terms they've ever had at Dartmouth. So I am grateful to everyone for persisting and, and for their patience and for their adherence to the constraints that we've had on us. And I'm also really looking forward to the spring when we will have warmer weather, less restrictions, more openness, more visitors, more activities. Uh, I'm really optimistic looking forward. I don't think I can top that. It's that's the right message. Thanks to everyone. Thanks, Rick. And thank everyone for tuning in today. We'll see you next time.